everyone. Welcome back to episode 29 of the Talk of Fame podcast. I'm Kylie, and today we have on actor, filmmaker, and writer Ashlyn Boots. Thank you so much for coming on, Ashlyn. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It's great speaking with you as well. Thank you so much. So over the last year, we've been in isolation. So what is something that you did over the last year that you wouldn't have had time to do before? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, Honestly, filmmaking in general was something that I used to do when I would come back and forth. So I, I was by coastal with California. Um, and when I was here over Christmas and I would also come back for summer break, I didn't really have that much to do because there's not a lot of acting here. So I just started to make little short films here and there. And then uh, when isolation hit, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was that was like back when like the song parodies started coming out. So people were like, I think Hello from the Other Side was like one of the big ones that like a guy remastered for uh, COVID. And so me and my friends all through Zoom, we were like, all right, let's do one, but for Hamilton. And so I wrote, (laughs) I rewrote all the lyrics to a bunch of different Hamilton songs. Then we filmed the music video kind of thing for it. Um, And that was actually like, it went pretty viral, viral for me at least. It got to like 9,000 views and then Broadway World, the official Broadway World account reposted it on one of their articles. So that was like the biggest point where I was like, wow, this turned out a lot better than I thought it did. And, you know, like I said, acting really wasn't a thing. It still really isn't um, just with the precautions that you have to take on set. So I started to uh, take community college classes for film and throughout like the last year I have made I think three three new projects and I'm in pre-production for two new projects as well so being here and having that time that I couldn't focus all on acting it's given me the opportunity to explore directing and writing more and I've found that like that is a viable career path for me as well where it used to just be a hobby but I've I found that love for that. Oh for sure like did you kind of expect the Hamilton video to kind of blow up or you, you just did expect it to blow up like you did? No, not at all because it was kind of, <laughs> I, I remember me and my mom having conversations about it because she was like, you're going to miss it. Like you're going to miss the trend because we really took our time to make it right. And we also wanted to make sure that we were safe doing it. Uh, And also it's really hard, like when you're an amateur filmmaker and you don't think about how you have to like line up your actor's lips to the audio, that takes a really long time to do. So it took a while for it to end up coming out. But then, yeah, the Broadway World article uh, was like really shocking for all of us. And then the next thing I believe that I put out was um, I, I... I loved Halloween in Los Angeles. It's Mm -hmm. such a big event. And I would go to Toluca Lake, if anybody knows where that is. And they always have like these really crazy decorations. And I would still go trick or treating. I was like 16, but I was like, you know what? It's fun. I like to dress up. That's so up my alley. So I was really upset that Halloween wasn't going to be celebrated last year. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a couple costumes and of course those couple Instagram post costumes turned into five Uh, and then on Halloween I'm going to post a video and I ended up uh, just doing kind of like a really weird abstract video that me and my my friend filmed in my basement and it was uh, with two snakes and that one we called your worst your worst your worst nightmare um, and that one on Facebook kind of went viral and that one hit 44,000 views. So that's like my highest achieving creation so far. So it's been weird. It's oh. been very surprising. <laughs> oh, for sure. So as like, we were kind of talking about before we started, we are from like small town, Pennsylvania. We're both mm-hmm. like, you're from the West side and from the East side. And like mostly in Pennsylvania, it's all kind of farmland for our Pennsylvania but like how was it kind of difficult for you to kind of start out as acting living in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania is not really known for being like acting and all that no I live like 40 miles north of Pittsburgh so I live in a really small uh, conservative town it's not really a thing to be an actor here you figure Pittsburgh uh, this economy has really <laughs> gone downhill after the uh, steel mills, mills left so yeah it's kind of left a lot of my community in poverty. So that's just not something that people prioritize here. The arts is not something that's like holds any weight whatsoever. So uh, as a child, I, at three, I told my mother, I didn't want to watch Barney anymore. I said to her, the actors in Barney are terrible. I 
only want to watch the Phantom of the Opera instead. So I was really into musicals, especially the Phantom. And then my preschool teacher pulled my mother aside and she was like, just so you know, Ashlyn's directing the whole class in Phantom of the Opera. They, this is the first year that my kids haven't played house because Ashlyn's putting on the Phantom of the Opera in preschool. So I think my parents at that point kind of had some inclination that was like, oh crap, like she isn't, she isn't a normal toddler whatsoever. So they put me into dance classes at a performing arts school here called Lincoln Park, which is a really like great, well-established school. And after only a couple of classes with them, my the teachers pulled my parents aside and they were like, if we're not challenging Ashlyn, like just let us know. And I was probably six at this time. And they looked at us and they looked at the teachers and were like, Ashlyn, like you talking about our daughter? Because I don't know, like, and they were like, oh yeah. So at that point I um, got further into just like the community theater that was offered around me. Um, mm -hmm. We drive a little bit closer to Pittsburgh for that. I was really lucky to uh, have at least something here. Like the Newcastle Playhouse has uh, this traveling group called the NCP Mini Stars. So I was a part of that. Um, and then my local theater that I was at is called JBT Jeter Backyard Theater. And they had a traveling team where we would go to... Um, Musical Theater International's Junior Theater Festival in Atlanta, and we got to compete there. So I was really, at, at a young age, really doing a lot of musical theater. And then at about nine, or I think about eight, um, I Musical Theater International asked me to go to New York to help workshop the Elf Junior musical. So that was kind of when my parents decided like, okay, we're going to let her do this full time. And that's something that I had been asking for for a really long time. So thankfully I had family that lived in New York. They let me stay with them. My mother would come and I would be going from Pittsburgh to New York to audition for shows. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years. I ended up uh, Musical Theater International gave JBT the pilot productions of the Magic Treehouse series. There's two, um, the Magic Treehouse books, and I was lucky enough to be Annie. So that was awesome. But it was around 10 where I had just booked an off-Broadway show, but I had been doing some of the acting camps that are offered here in Pittsburgh. And uh, an acting teacher, Trisha Simmons, came over to my mother and she was like, hey, I really think it would be worthwhile if you would let Ashlyn go out to LA for pilot season. It would just give her the opportunity to do that. So after a lot of discussion with my parents, my um, they let me go and their thought was kind of like, well, we're gonna let her go to California for three months with her grandma and it'll be like a really great like vacation, like once in a lifetime thing. And then she'll come home and we'll just keep doing, you know, the theater thing in, in New York. Um, and then I did it and I was like, yeah, no, this is, this is where I wanna be. I kind of boiled it down to the fact that like, do I want to do the same show every day for a year or do I want to do the same show different episode every week for three years four years however many seasons you get and that was kind of where my heart led me to but I really think for anybody that wants to be an actor like take advantage of what you can find in your hometown because I'm from like the rough of the rough you know what I mean like there's nothing here as far as uh theater or acting so just take whatever you can get oh for sure like where I am I'm from like Scranton Pennsylvania right. I've been to Scranton Wilkes-Barre and there's nothing here where I am there's nothing and no so, like when I, I went to California about like four times over the last couple of years, I went before COVID hit and like there's something about California that I love about it. I never want to leave. And so like I always talk to our parents, I bring up every once in a while. I'm like, it's okay if, if I can move to California while I'm old. You guys know how much I love California and not everything the arts and that's something I love about it and it the, has an energy to it it definitely yeah. has like an energy where you're like ah yes this this yeah. feels right yeah for sure and they're like Kylie that's across the country where we are and you can't be away from family because your family's around around us a couple minutes away and you lost it because they always want to be around family I'm like I can grow like I can try it. Like, there's not pressure, but yeah, you know. I don't know. I think that you need to do what makes you happy, and that's like the biggest thing that I've had. So many friends that want to be actors for the wrong reason, or are really good at it, and really 
are talented, but then decide that they want to go for the safer option. And I had one of my friends who was like a brilliant filmmaker and she's going to go be a lawyer. And that's great if that's her passion, but like, make sure that you're not pushing aside your happiness for the happiness of your family, because at the end of the day, you can always come home and visit them, but you got to make sure you're happy, you know? Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Because Pennsylvania, like where we are from, like both of us are from, like there's nothing here. Like It's terrible. <laughs> like, you know, most of Pennsylvania is farm, like, farmland. And so oh, like, yeah. you can't do anything. Like Farmland and the Amish. No hate to the Amish, but it's, it's, that's pretty much the only thing that's here. Yeah, the only thing. So if, if you want to come to Pennsylvania, I kind of don't recommend coming to Pennsylvania. There's really nothing here, depending where you are. But like, uh, like there's really nothing here. And that's why I kind of love traveling all over the place. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like California, Florida, like anywhere. I just want to be like, I don't want to be in the city where this atmosphere. I hate it. Like, I don't want to be here yeah. anymore. But like, there's always something about Pennsylvania that's cool. But like, you know, just. I think if you've never experienced, if you grew up in a city and you've never experienced this kind of like land, that's great. But I also, <laughs> it's not like we're, um, we're not cowboy country either. You know what I mean? We don't have yeah. like, we don't have like nice, like Arizona, like Western land to us. Yeah. We're just kind of like, the best way I can describe it is like mushy, like slushy, the ice, like the melted ice on the road, like slush and just like mm. cow. And that's really, it, it's no fancy like cowboy situation or even the cities are kind of small. It's it's just Pennsylvania. It's like Ohio, you know what I mean? There's yeah. no pizzazz to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as I kind of mentioned before, you're an actor, filmmaker, and writer. What made you want to start, what made you want to start that as you kind of were kind of talking about it before? Um, as far as acting goes, I don't think there was ever a moment where I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, it was just something that like I was so young that I I just knew, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, there was a lot of talks with my family and thankfully I was blessed with a really supportive family that allows me to do this and the the main conversation that really stuck in my head was when they said to me like well th they don't they're not in the acting world at all they're all athletic and baseball and you know pilots and doctors and that's kind of their thing yeah same um, here but they were like, you know what, if you were telling me that you wanted to play baseball and you had to go live in a different state for that, to have that full opportunity that's being offered to you, we would do that because we, we would support that, you know? And it's actually kind of funny because my brother, um, he's 14 and he just got signed to a national travel baseball team. So they literally do go across the country for baseball now as well. So it's kind of crazy yeah. how that like manifested itself into reality but yeah I was lucky that they they let me kind of take the lead in that situation same thing like when I um we bought a condo my parents bought a condo in California for me and that was another discussion where it was like do you ever see yourself moving home it wasn't like a pressure of you know you need to come home or this isn't the right thing I, I definitely living uh part of the time in Pennsylvania it's hard because you have that condescension of like mm. well when are you going to be when is this going to be over and when are you going to get a real job like are you you're going to go to school to be like a nurse or something right you know what yeah. I mean like yeah. eh, it's awful it's awful um and you get it from all sides and it's partially just because they haven't really been exposed to the culture of it but um I've been lucky that my parents have let me lead the way so as far as how I got into acting like I said before, I really think Phantom of the Opera was my first, like, creative awakening, <laughs> because yeah. especially at three, when all you're used to seeing is, like, Barney and Elmo, and all of a sudden you're watching this movie with, like, this amazing ornateness to it, and with the singing and the costumes, it was, like, mm, it touched my soul, um, and then I just kind of kept rolling with it. As far as, like, directing, Honestly, same thing. I don't think there was ever a moment where I was like, ooh, this is what I want to do. I had been in a couple of camps at Point Park University. They do summer camps for kids in high school. And I took a writing class 
And it was kind of a disaster with the people that I was partnered with, but I ended up writing something that I thought was really funny. And I was like, I want to make this. I think this is a, a cool idea. And um, that was the first short film that I had ever actually made. I mean, I had made little things here and there, like with my friends for fun on like the weekends and stuff like that. But this was like the first production that I actually wanted to put effort into. Um, and that turned out being crazy. We ended up getting our Burroughs Theater, which is like this really beautiful, um, like gold, like crested theater. And I had 30 different actors in total in that short film. It was about a, an elementary school talent show and the crazy acts that the kids put on. Um, and after that day, I was like, wow, <laughs> that was, that was, that was really fun. And I had ended up doing, um, another camp the year later at Point Park and that was more of a directing camp and I bonded really quickly with this girl Ariel and we worked together then moving forward on a lot of the projects and there's there's never been in my whole career like a moment of like yes but like this is what I think I want to do it's kind of just been like an intuition and like an an overall understanding within myself from like this is right does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, like, I, like, grew up, like, the same way you did. I grew up in, like, a sports kind of family. Everyone plays sports. I grew up playing sports, but playing sports was never kind of thing I wanted to do. I just did it to kind of have some activities just to do something. And my, my brother plays travel baseball as well. My twin brother, Chase, he plays travel baseball as well. He travels all over. He really, like, travels between, like, Pennsylvania and New York, sometimes different states, but mostly Pennsylvania and New York. That's where his kind of travel team is based off of is, like, where I am, like, Eastern Pennsylvania and New York. And yeah. they basically travel. And, like, when I started my podcast over quarantine, I would I never picture myself doing this. Like, I never picture myself being having a podcast, basically having this as a job. I do a constant I never picture myself doing this. And people actually ask me a, a lot. And they're like, Kylie, do you picture yourself doing this? Like, do you, do you, you will go to college for this? Since you're only 15 years old, you picture yourself doing this. I'm like, I don't know if I actually want to do this. Neither in like, I know I had to cut up to my family's expectations. These my cousins do journalism for a local news station. They're like, do you want to be what they want to be? Like, they have what like, they're doing. Mm -hmm. and they can be like your aunt Rani she's really good at it and your cousin John I'm like I don't know if that's something I kind of want to live up to I might be something else in industry and journalists might might not be something I actually kind of want to do and it's might be like a little kind of fun hobby like yeah. uh, but like there's something kind of people kind of live up to your expectations a little bit because I was always a shy, anxiety, depressed girl growing up. And I never oh. this. So they're always, my family's always like, Kylie, how are you doing a podcast if you're shy as heck? Like, how are you doing this? So like, I'm like, I'm, grow, I'm growing up. Like, 15 years old, I can't be shy anymore. I, mean, I got like no. a little girl that doesn't like to talk to people. Like, I'm not that person anymore. Like, this time goes, flies by for sure, really. Oh, it does. I just think like, you'll figure it out. You'll know. I'm lucky to have, I say it all the time. I'm lucky to have known since I was literally in diapers that the career path I wanted to do, I can't even imagine like having to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. But I think you'll like when, when you find the right thing, you'll know it feels right. Yeah, for sure. Like it's something like there's many options I have and people like, I always kind of lived up to my brother's expectations. He always carried my brother, and now he's, like, this little girl sitting here at, on the couch being, like, what, my, is my nap time not coming yet? Like, <laughs> like, 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 when I was a little kid, I never knew what I wanted to be. I always, like, I had options. It's never what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I always come to I'd be, like, a singer, actor, some type of way, because I always love sing, dance, any type of way. And then, now, like, when I tried acting, I'm, like, oh uh, this is not my thing oh yeah it's hard <laughs> yeah harder than I expected but do you have anyone that you look up to in the industry as an actor filmmaker and a writer or just kind of in general do you have anyone oh that's a good question um it's hard because I feel like no one should idolize anyone completely 
because you don't, you know what I mean? Like if I, if I had to pick a career, if you would have asked me this a couple years ago, I would have said Anne Hathaway. Um, recently though, some of her parts haven't been <laughs> the greatest. Um, I really admire Mindy Kaling for how she has been able to work as a writer, director, and actor. I mean, the Mindy Project is just like a perfect like wah, example of that. Um, mm -hmm. Tina Fey, all of the women that have been able to do to do that, because that's one of the things that I have. I have instances where I was directing my last short film, Ideas of Evil, and I was a pretty main character in, in that, but I made sure to shoot around myself. It all took place in a lecture hall, um, and I, I didn't speak until the very end. So that opportunity gave me the chance to really focus and like take the step into just directing, um, and I really, really was enjoying that. And um, then recently, there I just auditioned for Pride and Prejudice, and that experience, I, I walked away from my short film experience being like, that felt really good. I think I should just pursue being a director. And then I walk away from my Pride and Prejudice experience, and I go, that felt really good. I want, I still want to be an actor. You know what I mean? Yeah. So any, especially any woman that has been able to come up Mindy Kaling started off as a writer for The Office, and then they put her in the show, um, very similar to the lady who played Phyllis. Like, she was just the casting director, and they put her into the show. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do it like that. I would prefer to be an actor first, and then through the establishment of my acting career, go into writing, kind of like Tina Fey um, and Amy Poehler. So they they're the ladies that I'm like, if I could model a career and, like, have the same repertoire as them, I would be very happy. Oh, for sure. Like, as you're kind of I talked about a little bit of auditioning and all that, like, when you're usually auditioning for a role, either it's, like, a little short film, a movie, or, like, a show, like, what is the process, like, for you to get a role? And, like, what is kind of the process, like, for you to kind of get the role and, the, like, exactly the process to get to mm -hmm. the role? Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> um, you usually get the audition 24 to 48 hours in advance, so it's all very last minute. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you're lucky and it's two pages. Sometimes you open the PDF and it's like 10 pages and you're doing all the talking. So I will immediately email one of my acting teachers and get an appointment scheduled for them. And then I will just like do all of the pre-preparation as far as like the character goes, uh, trying to memorize the lines. And then I find what really helps for actors that are out there, this may just be a me thing, um, I find sleeping like not like on the script to be a really great thing. So like trying to memorize the whole thing, you know, sit down, take an hour, try to memorize the whole thing and then let it go, read it before bed, sleep. And then when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm, I'm with it a lot more. So don't try to try not to memorize the script the day you're going to the audition or the day you're going to shoot yourself tape. Uh, and then obviously working with the acting um, coach really helps. And then you, you kind of dress close close to the character. Um, sometimes it's a self-tape. More and more we're starting to see that self-tapes are taking over. So uh, I would either do my self-tape with my coach or I would go to, there's it's called Side Pocket Station in um, Los Angeles. So he j literally just self-tapes for people, but I could also do it. I have a, in my place in Pennsylvania, I have an office here where I have a backdrop set up and everything like that. Or you would go, uh, you would audition, I was um, an in-house actor for Nickelodeon a couple years mm -hmm. ago. So with that, I would go and audition and they would tell me in the room, like, okay, tomorrow's the callback. And then I would kind of have a better idea of the schedule. But as for literally anything else, um, they don't usually tell you anything. They don't tell you if they like you. They don't tell you when the uh, callback is going to be. They, they don't give you really anything to go off of. So you just go in yeah. and you hope you do your best. And then sometimes you get that email from your agent being like, okay, this is when the callback is. And sometimes you don't. And that's just kind of how it goes. <laughs> yeah, for but sure. Like, they're looking at, um, anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 actors for any part, you know, especially even just for like a guest star, they're looking at thousands and thousands of people. So to even get that first audition, you're really lucky because they went through how many computer screens of 
individual thumbnails of all of these actors' headshots that they're then narrowing down to the 200 people that they're going to see in person over two days, and then they're narrowing that down, and then, you know, process of elimination. So you can't get too invested in anything because the chances of you booking anything is like winning the lottery, is like we like to say. (laughs) But yeah, like the hardest part for me for like auditioning per se is like the, I'm not knowing if I'm getting a call back because I'm, I'm like a very kind of impatient kind of person that I'm like, I, what am I doing by myself? I hate waiting. Like, how, do I know if I have to roll? What do I have? I just hate it kind of, I'm just a very kind of impatient person that I keep like checking every five minutes with, did I get a call back or did I not? Like, what's happening? Yeah, it's hard, which is why like, community theater is really great if you are like an impatient person because you have that just like small scale community but like anything bigger than that it you really just have to like learn to not like to care but to not care you know what I mean obviously give all give your all of your effort into that audition but then as soon as you step out of that room you have to learn to let it go especially like if you get down and you're pinned for the final two and it doesn't end up being you it's hurts it's soul crushing because you get so excited I remember there was um I worked recurring on the Nickelodeon show School of Rock and they would always call and they'd be like okay so we want you here for this day but you know we we want you but give us like two days to run it through the execs to make sure and like nine times out of ten it would be yes you're coming but there was the one time one time when they called back and they said oh we're just going to cut the characters from that and I was crushed. And that was a great learning lesson of, no, it's not because they don't like me. It could be for a thousand different factors. They may already have the mother cast and I look absolutely nothing like the mother. They may already have the love interest cast and I'm a foot taller than him. Like there's so many different variables. I may go in and I may look like the casting director's ex-girlfriend and they may hold a grudge for that. You know what I mean? Like little subconscious things like that. It, it doesn't mean that they didn't like you or your performance. Most of the time, it's just like, you're not exactly what they had envisioned for the part. So it takes a lot of work to kind of let that go and not let it eat away at you. But it's something that you have to do or the disappointment's just going to like eat you alive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So as we're kind of talking about School Rock, you portrayed Regina on Nickelodeon series School Rock. What was that experience like for you to do that? It was awesome. It was like the best set experience ever. I remember um, I was pretty favored with the casting director, Susanna, for that. Um, And I had that was right around the time where I was also the in house actor. So I was like auditioning every other, every week, every other day, basically for a different show. So when I got this one, I walked into the casting room and I just remember sitting there with my grandmother and looking around and none of the girls looked anything remotely like me for this part. And I said to my grandmother, like, this doesn't look good. (laughs) This doesn't look good for me. And um, she, I remember her saying, yeah, you have about a snowball's chance in hell for this part. And that was the role that I booked, um, (laughs) which was so funny. And um, I was, I think I was around 11 at the time. And that was the first season. So I got to hang out with the cast pretty, pretty much like that whole week. And um, then I was brought back for every, every other season after that. So it was a really special experience to, have that be my first job and a lot of these other kids' first jobs, like professionally recurring on a show. And it it didn't start out as a recurring role. It was only for a guest star. And then I was lucky enough for them to be like, hey, we liked you. Like, we're going to bring you on now. Um, But it was, it was always just a good time. Like, I have nothing but nice things to say about the company, about the people. Um, Nickelodeon definitely, like, takes care of their actors. And it was just overall, like, a positive experience. Oh, for sure. So you're kind of like, as you're kind of talking about acting, filmmaking, and a writer and all that, like when um, you're also a filmmaker, as we kind of talked about before, like what is it like for you to work behind the scenes and so kind of working in front of the camera, usually acting? <laughs> yeah, I like it, but it, it's hard. So like when I'm an actor on a project, and it's not like a full scale production with like a network or anything like that. In those situations, I'm able to like turn my director brain off and just like go along with whatever they need me to do. Um, but when I'm an actor and like a student 
film or like a short film or something where like I can closely relate more to the to the producers and to the director a lot of times like I'll be like well what if we do it like this but it's something that I have to turn my brain off for that but yeah. um as far as like being a filmmaker and stepping more into that position it's been really awesome I work pretty much <laughs> I'm like pretty much the entire production company. I do a lot of the pre-productions. I have um, two partners, Olivia and Peyton, that help me out a ton. Peyton does a lot of the more um, camera work, which is something that I know that I need to improve on. Like I need to work with my technical side and my skills with the camera, but I really do enjoy working um, like on the finer details of the project. So um, for example, like my last film, Ideas of Evil, I was portraying the devil, basically, and I, I, I like to include little Easter eggs in there that I know no one's ever going to catch. No one's ever going to realize it, but for example, like I wore three fingers on each hand so that I had six rings on in total. Uh, little things like that, right? So then um, one of my actors in, in that um, film uh in a film, one of my films before that, she had played Eve from Adam and Eve. And um, in this film, we were talking, basically the whole film is a lecture set around the ideas of evil, how each different religion and group of people and cultures has an idea of the devil and evil, um, like story, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So when um, my professor was covering Adam and Eve, we cut to her sitting there because she was my Eve in a previous project. So I really like doing like those stupid little details that only I'm going to know about that are sentimental to me. And I like, I really like costuming. I, but um, it's just something that's been easy to step into and it gives you like a thrill, <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. it's really nice too, because as an actor, you read so many different scripts, so many different scripts and I feel like I have a good idea of like what's been done a lot and what mm -hmm. a lot of people go after and it's also taught me a lot about dialogue and how cringy dialogue can be especially if it's just you writing it so something that I always say to my actors which I think that more directors should do um is I'm not tied to this dialogue to your line so if this is not how you would say it change it make it like you know make the point still come across but change it into how you think you would say it so that it's natural you know what I mean because I think a lot of people have really great ideas and the execution is poor and one of those big things like the two big things that I think can really make or break a project um one of them being costumes and backdrop so like if you when I do my five days of Halloween costumes the costumes are important but if you're standing in front of your fireplace, no one's going to care. You know what I mean? Like you have to yeah. find a backdrop to, to fit. And then the other thing is dialogue because you can have an amazing story, but if you give your actors like robotic or uncomfortable dialogue, it's going to, it's not going to be a good result. Yeah, for sure. Like what is the kind of hardest part for you when you're kind of like directing behind the scenes? Like what is kind of the hardest part for you to do all those things kind of behind the scenes? Like you could talk about before like camera or just telling them what to do like or be like a director. Well, that's kind of <clears throat> yeah I well personally I have a really hard time um with <laughs> cameras <laughs> I I love how things turn out but I tend to be like you can take the camera I'll just tell you how to use it <laughs> you know what I mean like I'll tell you what what I want this to look like but you can figure out the mechanical stuff I'm not a very technical person yeah, um, so like working with all of the little different settings on cameras to like make this this and this I recently just bought a gimbal like figuring out how to work the gimbal is like anxiety filling for me so mm -hmm. I usually have someone with me um like I said it's Peyton I also Ariel was someone who would do that for me as well where I just kind of give the camera to them and I I will do like some things, but um, I would prefer to simply just direct and say, this is what this needs to look like and have someone else camera operate. Um, so that's hard for me, but it's also kind of like an easy fix. As an 18 year old, I just turned 18 in November. Um, what's really been hard is trying to get people to understand and take me seriously. Yeah. Uh, 
it just doesn't when you're a kid and when you're young it just doesn't happen it's just not mm -hmm. something that especially in Pittsburgh people can see past so I try to avoid if I'm like emailing people for locations or something like that I just try to avoid mentioning the fact that I'm um, a kid actually when I casted the part for the professor in my last project I put out um, like a casting call for it. And I made sure not to tell the actor that we ended up hiring how old I was until he got to set. And then like it came up naturally in conversation because people tend to underestimate you so much and it really can affect your project. Like I, um, I need for my, the project I'm, I'm in pre-production for, um, I need like a kind of basement situation. And I just did the 48 hour film project and I had this uh, experience where I was told over and over and over again how this company wanted to rent out their basement. And I was like, okay, perfect. Like, let me contact them and be like, hey, I'm a returning customer. I was in this, you know, 48-hour film project. I want to rent out your basement. Um, unfortunately, I made the mistake of telling them how old I was, which I think is the main reason why I was told no, because I had been told over and over and over how much um, they wanted to rent this out to indie filmmakers. So... That, and then, like, obviously, you run into, um, I do it to myself. Like, I only want to make period pieces for some reason. I, I, I would not say that I wouldn't want to make something in the present, but my ideas tend to be a little bit more period-based, um, or... Yeah. Or they're like, they could be based in the present, but like something's weird about them. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I, I, I find myself writing scripts where I'm like, I'm never going to get this location. Why am I doing this to myself? You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm never going to be able to get like for next year's Halloween video. I'm like, I'm never going to be able to get a 14th century torture chamber, but here I am writing about it. You know what I mean? And like, this is yeah. the project that I want to do. So I feel like that has been a big learning lesson of like, okay, no, you have to pick projects that you can realistically pull off and that was a big thing that I also learned back when I was in one of those summer camps because a lot of my uh, fellow students chose to make films about like oh this guy is curing cancer but also we're filming it and it's set in an empty dorm room and the actor is 17. It just, like, doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you really have to make sure you can pull all those pieces together. But that's been really great about getting into film, if you know that's what you want to do, and making as much as you can is, like, the most important thing because – and obviously having connections as well because I ended up selling Ideas of Evil to Muse TV. And now instead of saying – oh, you know, I had a Broadway article pick this up and, oh, you know, I had 44,000 views on this video. I am able to say, yes, I've done all of these things and, like, that's great. You don't need to know how old I am, but I also have created a film that has been picked up by Amazon. You know what I mean? So having yeah. that establishment um, has really helped, but being 17, 18, man, people don't take you seriously at all. It's been, it's been rough. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Imagine being kind of like a 15-year-old girl having her own podcast and people are like, why uh, is a 15-year-old having a podcast at her age? Like, I don't want bigger series. So I'm going to say no to this. Like, I don't care. Yeah, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir then. <laughs> yeah. So the final question for the interview is, what is some advice for younger generations? I like to be in, in, in an industry one day. Ooh. <sighs> just try to work as much as you can um, because you'll discover like what little niche you like the most but don't if you want to be an actor don't wait until you're 18 to start pursuing that put yourself in musical theater if your parents aren't supportive like find a way to have transportation find a way to be in the industry that you want to be because experience and connections matter the most. If anything has, mm -hmm. if I've learned anything, it's that experience and connections matter the most because you need to have that training. Um, and even if you can't afford lessons or anything like that, just being in community theater can teach you so much. It's also, theater is just such a great, strong background to have. But also at the end of the day, I really... I, my heart goes out to people that can't do it, but I also have no sympathy for people that don't 
create opportunities for themselves. If you want to live in LA and you want to work as an actor, take your life into your own hands and do it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. be, if my parents, I'm like I said, I'm lucky enough that my parents have supported me. If they hadn't, I would be in community theater right now. I would still be taking every opportunity that I can to have those actions. Another really great thing is work ethic. You have, you have to have a crazy work ethic or you're never going to get anywhere. And that mm -hmm. also extends to, and I know this isn't as realistic for people that are in like an everyday nine to whatever, three school, but try to have a job, any sort of after school job where you're making money because like realistically, um, let's say you go to college for theater. Great. Um, your next step after that is not only being 30, 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars in debt from school is to then move to a major location like Atlanta, New York, LA and start that opportunity. But guess what you're going to need for that? You're going to need a down payment on a apartment. You're going to need to furnish that apartment. Um, you're going to have to give your first and last month's worth of rent. It's expensive. And California is expensive. New York is yeah. expensive. So get a part-time job. Um, save as much money as you can because you're going to get out there and then you're going to find that not only do you have all these living costs, but now you have to have headshots and headshots are $500. And now you have to sign up for all of these different acting sites that are $10 a month. And now, you know, you have to be in this, 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 and this class and acting classes are expensive. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. training is really important and headshots are really important and having a house is really important, but all of it is expensive. And the more you can do, you know, you may feel like, oh, I can't do anything until I'm 18 and then I, I can go to college or, oh, I can't do anything until I'm 18 and then I can go live in LA. No, there are things that you can be doing while you're sitting, you know, in Western Pennsylvania or wherever you are in the country that's not an entertainment capital to prepare yourself for that. There's even like, don't TikTok act. Don't, don't try to take acting advice from TikTok. <laughs> that's never yeah. going to work out. I feel like I see people doing that and I'm like, oh God, there, <laughs> there are, um, acting teachers that will put out like YouTube videos, try to watch as many YouTube videos, try to watch as many movies as you can so that you know what people are talking about. Um, there are books, like just try to educate yourself as much as possible, especially if you're not going to go to school for acting or for musical theater or for anything like that. But having like a solid savings account is like the best thing you can be doing <laughs> because yeah. it's going to be rough. It is expensive, especially like if you don't have a car, you know, you have to think about, or if you do have a car, are you going to ship your car? Are you going to drive your car? Um, it's a lot of pre-planning, but also advice that I've heard other people say, but it still hits home. If you're not sure you want to do it, you probably don't want to. <laughs> if you don't know, like, with your whole being that you want to be an actor and you sincerely cannot picture yourself doing anything else, then maybe it's not for you um, because it's hard and people are mean and you're going to get a lot of no's before you get one yes and it's going to feel like it's a lot of work for no outcome, but you have to do it to know like, I can't, I cannot see myself literally doing anything else. You know what I mean? And yeah. if you want to go in it for, like, the money or for fame or for, TikTok, like, for clout, go to TikTok, go to YouTube, do something easier like that. Um, mm -hmm. Because that is something that has been really frustrating as a longtime actor where I feel like I've climbed my way to the top to be in these master classes, to do these great things. And then I'm sitting next to someone who turns to me and goes, oh, I have 8 million followers on TikTok. That's how I got to be in this class. So if you don't want to be an actor, don't do it. But you have to know how rough it's going to be and still want to do it anyways, because it's about consistency. Yeah, for sure. Because acting is like it's such a, a really hard thing to do. People always say like, oh, I want to be an actor because I want a million followers. I want to be like Zendaya or Tom Holland or any of those A-listers like that. And, like, no. yeah, and that's so like unrealistic that. too. Like how many people are going to actually be able to be an A-list celebrity? Th for me, best case scenario is someone like my acting teacher who has had a really great career, has had a lot of opportunities 
but she can go to the grocery store and no one's going to know who she is. You know what I mean? And, but she's able to, if I can sustain myself on the salary as, as my, on my salary as an actor, I've won in life. I've achieved what I I came to do, but do do not go into it thinking you're going to be uh, Marilyn Monroe because you're not. (laughs) It's just like, it's, it's not going to, you're, like I said, you're winning the lottery if you book anything at all. So I think how lucky you have to be to really be famous. Yeah. I mean, if you want, if you want fame, go, go to TikTok. Yeah. TikTok is like the best thing to go to is like, there's so many people on the app and you'll probably get fast. It's much faster and a little easier for you to do that. Even if you're just pretending to do the acting videos that you've seen or like singing or just no, like dancing videos, whatever. It's really easier yeah. than acting. And no one's, it's very difficult to be like Marilyn Monroe, like Hugh Jackman and those, all those big A-list celebrities. And I always told myself that I always wanted to be Marilyn Monroe and all those yeah. celebrities. I, and I tell myself now that when I was younger, I see my, now I think like, I'm not going there. I, I keep, keep dreaming, but I'm not going there. And I, that's a, I can keep sliding, work for it, but that's not going to happen for a long time. So just get a little out of your head for now. Oh, yeah. And it's so important to also, like, meditation is a really big thing because, yeah, yeah, it's easy to, like, do, like, comedy and stuff like that you don't need that for. But there will be times where, like, you're not expecting, oh, excuse my phone ringing. Um, There will be times when you're not expecting uh, to, like, there was a time where I was on set and I thought this was going to be, like, a real funny, you know, sort of skit. And, like, the director came over and was like, we need you to cry. And you will be caught off guard. And a lot of times I think people resort to like what I think the most coined term is like method acting where, Mm -hmm. you know, you're like, okay, I need to think of something traumatic that happened to me to do this. And then sure, great, you can do it and it looks amazing and whatever, but then cut, like we're going to lunch and now you're sitting there on the floor crying and there's no way to pull yourself out of that. So making sure that you act in a healthy, like responsible way and meditate before and after big emotional scenes. Cause it's a really great, like waiting place to kind of tell your body and your mind, like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm about to go do this crazy thing. And then I have this thing. That's a nice medium space to get out of it. Um, and that's so, so, so important because you see people, I think method acting can be really dangerous because you see people like portray the joker and kind of go crazy and never fully recover from that yeah so yeah I totally agree with that so like meditation is one of the best things to do I do it sometimes on my mother and like meditation is one of the biggest things on our society like it can help us in many ways even if we're sort of anxiety depression and mm-hmm. years to do meditation like I used to say no all the time now I do it every once in a while but now really but like Meditation is such a big role, even if you're having a stressful day or you're just nervous about a situation. Like, meditation is such a big role you should definitely do. Absolutely. So uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to come on. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. And we'll speak soon for sure. Thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Thank you so much. Of course. It was nice meeting you. Yes. Nice meeting you too. Bye.